Getting stuck in traffic is horrendous, but even worse than that, doesn't it too often feel like we're the ones stuck in the slowest lane? And maybe I'm just being paranoid, but honestly, this seems to happen so much it almost feels like the universe is conspiring to make me perpetually late or something. So why is that? Are we just being delusional or is there actually any truth to it? The answer is more surprising than you might think. Although you know what's worse than getting stuck in traffic? Trying to get stuck in traffic and failing because apparently there are just no cars on the road and I've spent my entire day. According to a recent study, the average US commuter spends 54 hours per year stuck in traffic. This adds up to over 5 billion person hours of lost time. With that time, we could build more than 200 Burj Khalifas, 600 Empire State Buildings, 5 Large Hadron Colliders, or not even one California High Speed Railway. Huh. Anyway, you can see why traffic jams, and especially the psychological effects of them, are a worthwhile area of study. And back in 1999, two researchers looked into this specific phenomenon of why it is so many of us feel like we spend too much time stuck in the slowest lane. And what they found was that even in situations where there are two lanes going at roughly the same speed, there are psychological factors that can make us feel like our one is going slower. Firstly, drivers typically only check out what the adjacent lanes are up to when they themselves aren't moving. Secondly, because drivers fortunately look forwards more than backwards, cars that they overtake tend to disappear from view pretty quickly, whereas the ones that overtake them stay in their field of vision for longer, making them more memorable. And lastly, they suggested that our natural human competitiveness makes being overtaken more um, emotionally salient, shall we say, than being the overtaker. By the way, I hope you'll notice that I'm in a Tesla. Anyway, from that they concluded that actually the phenomenon really is just in our heads. And while their findings may carry a lot of truth, there's also a much more straightforward explanation that the authors completely failed to mention. And that's maybe we feel like we're in the slow lane because we usually are in the slow lane. So how can that be? Well, to understand why, first we need to understand something known as selection effects. Now, selection effects are just another name for the biases that can occur when the method that you use to collect your data or your information in an experiment leads to a skewed or only partial subset of results. Like if an oceanographer wants to measure the size of all the fish in a patch of ocean, but only uses a wide gap fishing net to catch their sample, then all the fish that are smaller than the holes in the net will pass through. And when the oceanographer then looks back in their net, they'll wrongly conclude that all the fish are of a certain size or bigger. Very silly. Now, of course, good researchers are aware that the instruments they use to collect their measurements can bias results. But at the same time, selection effects can be surprisingly tricky to spot. And there's an especially slippery type of them known as observer selection effects. And I wanted to make a video on observer selection effects because, well, they kind of hide in the shadows of our reasoning and are very counterintuitive. So what are they? Well, just as our incompetent oceanographer created selection effects in his data by using too gappy of a net, he could also create them just by being there. Maybe all the little fish are super terrified of boats and so are never around to be measured. Or maybe the big ones are super into them. The point is, Sometimes an observer can create sort of biases or errors and screw things up by their mere presence, hence the observer selection effects name. And as you may have guessed, these observer selection effects affect our traffic situation thingy in a major way. Because when we're stuck in a jam, it's easy to forget that we're not just in traffic, we are traffic. To understand why, meet Bob. Poor old Bob's stuck in a traffic jam that consists of these three lanes. Now, you can't see which car he's in, but if you had to bet, which of the three lanes would you pick? Obviously, you should pick lane B, as it contains more cars than the other two. And in the same way, whenever we're the ones stuck in traffic, we're statistically more likely to find ourselves in whichever lane contains the most observers, and therefore, the most cars. And what happens when you cram lots and lots of cars into a single lane? So next time you're all stressed out from being late to work, at least there's a universal statistical phenomenon you can blame it on. 
And speaking of the universe, the reason why I'm so obsessed with these observer selection effects is because, well, they can really affect the way we think about some of these big picture questions about the nature of reality. In fact, they can completely mess with our heads sometimes and even trick us into thinking the answers to some of these questions are super obvious, even when there's often very little evidence to support them. Now, a great example of this is the fun question of aliens. You know, are we alone in the universe or just one in a cosmos teeming with intelligence? Which, as you're probably aware, is a topic that tends to attract people who are easily upset and believe some deeply weird shit. Almost to the point it's like aliens is their religion or something, but seeing as you're all reasonable people, I'm going to assume that you do at least agree with me that this remains a partially unanswered question. Anyway, if you're anything like me, then your first instinct when pondering this is to go something like, well, we exist, and so intelligence can't be that hard for the universe to come by, especially as there are trillions and trillions of planets out there, so they've got to be at least some smart aliens, right? But the thing is, our intuitions are easily observer selection affected. And so while it might feel like our existence is some kind of conclusive proof that intelligence is therefore ubiquitous, in reality, it's actually not that strong of evidence because, well, we've only got one data point, the Earth, to go by. And actually, whether the true chances of intelligent life evolving on any given planet are really, really likely, or as inconceivable as one in a trillion, 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 in both of those cases, we have to exist in order to even consider the question in the first place. And in fact, the only conclusion that we can reasonably draw about the likelihood of intelligent life is that it can exist, that the number is a number greater than zero. But anything more than that, we can't know until we find a second data point, until we find conclusive evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, which I'm sorry, internet, we just haven't found yet. Similarly, consider the whole cosmological fine-tuning problem. If any of the major physics of the universe, like the strength of gravity, or the charge on an electron, or even the number of spatial dimensions, were even just a tiny bit different, then not even stars or galaxies would have been able to form, let alone life like us. It's a seeming miracle out of all the possible values they could have taken, they all took on exactly the right ones that we need to exist. In fact, it all seems so perfect that to some people, this is cut and dry proof that an intelligent designer must have created the universe for us. And who knows, maybe it was. Although it's really not a rabbit hole I wanna go down today, especially as this was meant to be a video about traffic. Anyway, what's important is to remember how observer selection effects could mess with how we think about this problem. For example, what if a universe had very different physics to our own and therefore was of a type completely inhospitable to life? In that case, there'd be no observers around to witness it. We could in fact be in a multiverse situation where there's countless other weird universes, each with different variations of all the physical constants, all doing their lonely thing without anyone able to evolve to observe it. But either way, in any universe where an observer does evolve, then pretty much by definition, they'll find their universe appearing fine-tuned for their existence, kind of like ours does with us. Now, of course, the multiverse theory is just one possible explanation out of many for this question of fine tuning. And let me be clear that I don't therefore think it's some kind of proof against the existence of God. In fact, intelligent design is arguably just as plausible of an explanation too. The point I'm simply trying to make is that the appearance of fine tuning in the universe isn't definitive proof for God either. And yet, so many people seem to claim that it is, and I personally think that observer selection effects are at least partially to blame for this extreme level of certainty that so many people have in that particular explanation. That's right, traffic. Yes, so what should we do next time we feel like we're stuck in the slow lane? Well, if it wasn't for the massively increased risk of accidents, I guess the optimal solution would be for everyone to keep switching backwards and forwards until some kind of equilibrium is reached and flow rate is maximized across the full width of the motorway. But seeing as that is neither safe nor remotely feasible, I guess we'll just have to be content for now knowing that at least we're not being completely paranoid because thanks to observer selection effects, we really are most likely stuck in the slow lane. Unless, of course, the whole world is driving self-driving cars, in which case that actually would be feasible because they would be able to handle switching lanes perfectly against each other. They could all communicate in some kind of like hive mind brain thing to 
maximize flow rate. Oh, it would be so beautiful. Thank you so much for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed this because this was a fascinating topic for me to research. And if you want to take a deeper dive, I recommend you check out Nick Bostrom's book, Anthropic Bias, which covers much of the material that I sort of touched on lightly in this video today. So it's a really, really deep dive, so check it out. Also, uh, I wrote a little bit myself on this topic of the Fermi paradox and aliens. So again, that link is below. And lastly, of course, click that subscribe and the bell button and I'll catch you next time.